waste much time. After returning from his two to three year second missionary journey and taking a brief break in Antioch, he sets off again, this time for his third, his longest, and his furthest distance missionary journey. So thank you for joining us today as we join with Paul now on his third and final missionary journey, sharing the gospel across the Eastern Mediterranean world. Before jumping into the travels of Paul's third missionary journey, however, we should take a moment to consider how people went about traveling in the ancient world. Travel was, of course, very different than as uh, we experience it now. There were no engines, no uh, vulcanized rubber, certainly no uh, air travel or safe travel by sea. And the general mechanism by going uh, around the world at that time was largely to walk. Fortunately, the Romans had an extremely advanced road system, one that was not surpassed even for over a thousand years after these roads were built. This road network was extremely extensive. It spanned from northern England down to southern Egypt, and their paved roads encompassed between 50 and 75,000 miles of roadway. In addition, there was another roughly 250,000 miles of unpaved or gravel roads. Uh, but these paved roads were extraordinary infrastructure undertakings that greatly expedited travel, trade, and military transport during the time of the Roman Empire. These roads were meticulously constructed. To create them, a ditch was dug between three and six feet deep depending on the terrain, and after excavation would be filled in with large stones that was then filled in with sand. What followed was a couple series of gravel and then finally a concrete layer with large flat polygonal stones, which was then covered over with a thin layer of concrete. The final surface was rather smooth, while the roads that we see today remaining are uh, fairly rough and irregular, those are the, the second layer that's been exposed of the polygonal stones. Uh, but in the original time that they were used, they would have been covered over by another thin layer of concrete. They were also bowed slightly so that rain and snow would slough off to the side. And these roads, given their complex and thorough construction, were extremely durable requiring little maintenance in its time and, as already mentioned, lasting many hundreds of years so that they were still in use extensively during the Middle Ages and some are even now, 2,000 years later, still occasionally in use today. Roman road construction had a couple unique aspects to it. The first is that their roads were incredibly straight. The Romans valued that the shortest distance between two spaces is a, is a straight line. And so they would build their roads directly from one location to another, which meant that they had to also build along with it uh, viaducts, bridges, and even occasionally tunnels, the longest of which is just over half a mile long, to facilitate the straightness of their roads. Indeed, their, their directness is rather remarkable considering the limited construction techniques available at the time. Interestingly, these roads would often, even when approaching a hill, rather than bend around them, would simply go straight up and right over them. <laughs> the Romans also had a high value for fortitude and strength and often preferred to just deal with things strongly head on rather than take a gentler, even if much easier, route around hills and mountains. A couple interesting features of these Roman roads were that they were marked with milestones. Large, five-foot-tall stone markers, usually about two tons in weight, that would indicate the distance to the next city. These were placed squarely every mile a mile deriving from the Roman word mile, or a thousand, which was a thousand paces. And these uh, were placed all across the Roman Empire, the greatest of which was the Golden Milepost, centered in the city of Rome itself. 
which at the time supposedly had the distances to all the major cities listed on it. And at that time, indeed, all roads led to Rome. These roads also often had toll booths for use. They frequently had what were called mansiones, or resting houses, which were built by the state every 16 to 19 miles. That would be a source of refreshment, providing uh, water, and also facilities for cooking food. Occasionally, there were official lodgings nearby these mansiones as well, as well as changing stations for those that were traveling by horse. On these roads, individuals frequently would be able to travel about 16 to 19 miles per day. However, a courier or a professional emissary may cover up to 50 miles within a 24-hour period, utilizing these changing stations. However, even on these roads, the most common means of transport was simply by foot. The Romans had not developed uh, stirrups, and so while one could indeed ride on a horse, and they did utilize horses for various purposes, long-distance riding was generally not the most comfortable way of going. They also had a variety of carriages to tow products as well as individuals. However, they neither had invented any type of suspension, and their wheels were usually iron shod. And so traveling in these carriages, while usually reserved only for the wealthiest individuals, was itself not terribly comfortable. And so most people, uh, even if having a pack animal, would usually walk alongside carrying their food, their tent, their clothing, and even their water. Everything they needed to travel themselves on their way. And the other principal way by which people traveled through the ancient Roman Empire was by boat. However, while the Romans were extraordinary in their road building, they were also famous for being terrible sailors. Roman history is full of instances of people losing their way at sea, of being blown off course by winds, and the Romans were not themselves a seafaring people. They acquired their shipbuilding techniques and their basic navigational skills from the peoples whom they conquered. The, uh, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Carthaginians, themselves very advanced and apt uh, navigators. Uh, but the Romans did not have a high regard for seafaring and uh, generally had a, a second-class view of naval affairs and so were not renowned themselves for their navigational abilities. However, the Romans certainly did utilize ships They had uh, warships that were powered by uh, oarsmen, up to uh, 300 rowers who would be uh, involved in these largest of ships known as quincareams, and uh, they would have about 180 oars and were roughly 45 meters long. So they were fairly large ships, displacing about 100 tons. And they also used merchant vessels to transport grain, especially from Egypt, to transport olive oil and wine from Greece and the Near East, as well as for important minerals, uh, such as iron or copper, marble, granite, and so forth. And these transport ships were utilized extensively around the Mediterranean world to move product. The largest of these were up to 55 meters long and could carry about 1,200 tons of material. A single one of these could carry enough grain to feed a city for an entire year. And this, uh, this transport was, of course, efficient and widely used, even if somewhat dangerous, comparative to traveling on road. Such was the volume, however, that up to 1,200 of these large ships would arrive in Rome's port of Ostia each year to give some sense of the wide variety of commerce transacted by sea. And to do so, uh, Romans frequently would stay close to shores, oftentimes going from small islands uh, to the next, especially in the eastern Mediterranean, to avoid being blown off course. And they often used these islands or uh, coastlines as markers. The Romans generally sailed by directions that they had recorded down and would key off notable features on the land.
They had directions not only across the Mediterranean, but also up the Atlantic coast of France, down the coast of Africa, through the Persian Gulf, and even down to India. So their trade network was extremely extensive. And so large were these merchant ships that they were not themselves exceeded in size in Europe until the 15th century, well after the Age of Discovery and the, the large deep water navigation ships had been constructed. So sizable were these ancient Roman craft. Paul takes these ships on some occasions. There was nearly no private sailing at that time, and people desiring to travel by sea would need to reserve a place on one of these merchant ships. Uh, themselves could carry hundreds of people in addition to their cargo. Passengers would generally sleep on deck in tents. They would cook their own food with facilities provided and just generally entertain themselves during the journey. But uh, contracting for smaller boats or for private vessels was uh, economically inefficient. And so Paul, when he's traveling, is generally traveling uh, in all likelihood on these larger vessels that are traveling by the hundreds and even thousands around the ancient world at that time. Paul utilizes both these modes, traveling both by road and by sea, in bringing the Gospels to cities that have not yet heard it. In his third missionary journey, he sets out very similarly as on his second missionary journey and visits many of the same cities. The scriptures say, beginning in Acts 18, that he travels overland through Asia Minor, likely visiting many of those cities that he had first visited in Galatia on his first missionary journey and probably encouraging them again as he passes through town. While on the second missionary journey, he had likely intended to go to Ephesus, but was prevented by the Holy Spirit. On this third missionary journey, he successfully goes directly there. And it is here in the city of Ephesus, the second largest city in this eastern part of the Roman Empire, that Paul spends the longest portion of time and probably has the most success. This city of Ephesus was a relatively large Roman city, comprised of approximately a quarter million people. And it was an important trading port uh, on the western coast of the Asia Minor Peninsula. Ephesus was an important commercial hub and was also renowned for its uh, huge temple of Artemis, one of the great seven wonders of the ancient world, which was uh, certainly deserving of its title. This uh, city was uh, relatively cosmopolitan. It had a sizable Jewish population as well. And Paul, when he arrives here in this great city of Ephesus, begins as he usually does by first visiting the synagogue. Acts 19 says that he uh, preached the gospel there for about three months before he was, of course, uh, driven out. And thereafter, he continued to share the good news publicly uh, renting a hall, uh, a lecture hall, used by a gentleman named Tyrannus, uh, an interesting name, of course. And there, uh, he, the scriptures say he daily shared the news. And uh, it is through this daily preaching over the course of two years that many of the people of Ephesus themselves heard the word. And because Ephesus was such an important trading center, likely many other peoples from Asia uh, heard, whether directly or indirectly, this good news. Uh, the scriptures report the overall success of his preaching, and this is also found in the response of uh, other uh, groups within the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was well known as being a center of magic and of uh, secret formulations and of spells and so forth. And the scriptures say that uh, Paul's preaching was so successful that many of these magicians burned their, their scrolls and their, their spell books. Uh, moreover, there was a great conflict between uh, the silversmiths who built idols to Artemis and Paul. Uh, his preaching was so successful that they perceived a 
negative effect on their sales of, of silver idols, and there followed a large riot. Uh, the scriptures describe how the, uh, the theater was filled with people protesting. And uh, after this time, Paul eventually decided to leave Ephesus and move on. But this is a good indication of the strength of his impact of his years of preaching there. There is also record in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, as well as the other references elsewhere in Paul's letters, that Ephesus, while successful, was not necessarily an easy time. He recurrently ran into uh, objections. His uh, first letter says that he fought with wild beasts there, meaning probably he struggled with fierce opponents. And so it was not smooth sailing there in the city of Ephesus. But upon his departure, there was definitely an established Christian community. And it's notable that in Paul's later letter to these Ephesians, he writes not a specific letter to this, to one individual group of people, but rather he writes what's known as a cyclical letter, one that's intended to be passed around from church to church, something more general, that probably indicates that there was not simply a single church, but multiple churches, at least in Ephesus, but possibly also in the wider region that had uh, begun to flourish after his sharing the gospel there. Paul's preaching in Ephesus comprises the majority of his work on this third missionary journey, but he does indeed go on. He decides to pass along into Macedonia, visiting the cities that he had formerly uh, preached the gospel in, likely Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, and also comes back down to Achaia. After a plot on his life, uh, Paul, rather than returning by sea, decides to go back up through Macedonia again and finally works his way down, passing by Ephesus and sailing by sea all the way back to Jerusalem. This missionary journey lasts anywhere from three to five years, depending on the length of time that he stayed in each of these cities. Uh, but this indicates his longest journey and also his journey of greatest extent as he pushed beyond the bounds of the second missionary journey by going as far as Illyricum. And so Paul, we see, continues to push the limits of his travels, going further and further to share the good news with newer peoples and newer places, even while he continues to visit and strengthen places in which he has already preached and ministered. Fortunately, visitors to Ephesus today can behold a trove of ancient ruins, this site is probably one of the very best preserved and extensive of ancient sites that can be visited on travels following in Paul's footsteps. Ephesus at its time was again a very large city, and fortunately many of these buildings, monuments, and infrastructure remarkably well preserved today. Visitors will often begin in the State Agora, which is approximately 160 by 60 meters, and there, one can find a number of fountains, of monuments, temples to various persons, public baths, as well as a variety of houses and courtyards. One may also find here the Perteion, which held the sacred fire of the city. This was uh, where people would tend this eternal fire, something indicating the life of the city, and which would be perennially maintained here in this building. There's also nearby an Odeon, which was essentially a concert hall for about 1,500 people. And here one can get a sense of the type of lecture hall that Paul probably rented to share his gospel as he ministered here in Ephesus. Passing along, there's also a number of gates, both the Gate of Hadrian and the Magnesian Gate. There is remnants of the enormous Celsus Library, which was one of the largest libraries in the ancient world. It was at its time roughly three stories tall and held many, many volumes. Fortunately, we can also still visit today the theater where the riot took place, uh, insisting that Paul and his Christian message be driven out of Ephesus. This ancient theater probably held around 25,000 people and one can get a sense of how large this riot may have become if indeed it was filled with, with chanting rioters. Also of interest, though comparatively little to be seen today, is the base of the Temple of Artemis, 
This was indeed one of the seven wonders of the world, built in the 6th and then rebuilt in the 4th century BC, out of pure marble. It was about 370 feet long, about 60 feet high, and it was held up by 117 columns. It was truly a massive structure, uh, built to the goddess of Artemis, and it would have been a destination site of travelers adding to the, the travel and the commercial activity of the city of Ephesus. Interestingly, Ephesus, while a major stopping point for St. Paul and his sharing of the gospel there, is most associated today with St. John. Uh, after leaving the area around Jerusalem, uh, St. John uh, supposedly ventured on and stayed in Ephesus. And it doesn't seem as though he likely went alone either, as there's uh, commemorations not only of John, but also of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus, in John chapter 19, gave to John uh, his mother to look after her. And so here in the city of Ephesus, there is a, a church of Mary, as well as a basilica of St. John. And both these persons are highly regarded as important to the city of Ephesus. There's also a house of Mary, a, uh, the place supposedly where, where Mary may have lived. It was identified in a vision by a German nun, and it was later located uh, here in Ephesus. And while its location is somewhat questionable, it may indeed have been built on a previous site where Mary lived. And to the south of Ephesus, in the city of Miletus, there remains a large theater. It was in this city that Paul had his final farewell on his return voyage on this third missionary journey and has his farewell speech with the leaders of the church in Asia Minor. Interestingly, in this theater, one can still see an inscription on a seat that says, reserved for the God-fearers, the name held by those individuals who were devotees of the Jewish faith, but yet Gentiles, another indication of the actual circumstances that Paul encountered when traveling through these areas 2,000 years ago. Paul, completing his third missionary journey, was probably relatively satisfied. Though he certainly encountered hardship as he went, he, returning on his way, could not otherwise have been somewhat pleased by his visiting again of many cities that he had previously uh, labored at sharing the gospel and finding these communities of faith growing and still active. After this third missionary journey, he decides to return to Jerusalem, hoping to be there for the day of Pentecost. And it is here at Jerusalem that Paul finally has uh, his great last conflict in which he is finally imprisoned and shipped off to trial in Rome. And for this last major episode in Paul's life and for his travels subsequently to the city of Rome, we will cover in our last class, that of Paul's travel to Rome. And so we hope you will join us for our next and final lesson as we conclude our series on Paul the Voyager. God bless you, and we hope to see you again.